Being able to analyze jazz standards with Roman numeral analysis can be incredibly helpful when it comes to improvising, just understanding how the chord progressions work, how they connect together, and where they're ultimately leading can be really insightful. So in today's video, I'm gonna be going over a jazz standard from scratch, analyzing it, showing you how I do it to help us learn together. All right, let's do this thing. What's up, Brent here from LearnJazzStandards.com, which is a blog, a podcast, and videos all geared towards helping you become a better jazz musician. Make sure you subscribe at the button below, hit the bell notification button in case you don't want to miss out on anything that goes on on this channel. Like I said, understanding how to analyze jazz standards can be helpful. I like to think about it as, you know, looking at a map before we're trying to get to a certain destination. Like, sure, we can just start driving the roads and trying to get there, but if we look at the entire scope, the entire picture, it can help us choose the right paths to get to the destination the most efficiently and in general, just make things a lot more clearer. So without further ado, I'm going to go over this jazz standard right here, Tune Up. This is a Miles Davis tune, and in case you aren't familiar with it, it sounds like this. So that's the tune. You probably recognize that one, Miles Davis. But let's go over this from scratch and try to figure out what, uh, how the chords work and how we can start analyzing this. So the first thing that goes through my mind here is I need to understand how to, uh, I need to understand the diatonic series. And in this case, I can see we have a bunch of major seventh chords in here. So I really need to understand major harmony. Now, I'm not going to go over that in detail today. You know, what's a one chord? What's a two chord? What's a three chord, four chord, five chord, six chord, seven chord. I am going to leave a link uh, in the description below to a video that will help you with that if you're more of a beginner on this. So the first thing I need to start figuring out is, you know, what is the diatonic key center that we're dealing with here? So the first thing I look for is over here, the key signature. Now the key signature has no sharps or flats in it. So the first thing that I would think about is, well, no sharps or flats. If I know anything about jazz theory, that means either the key of C major or the key of A minor. Now looking through here, I do see a C major right here, but we do start with a resolution to a D major seven. And I say it's a resolution because I see that it kind of lands here for two bars. So I feel like that's a resolution. I see another resolution here at C major. So that might fit in with my key signature theory. I see another resolution here and you'll see why I think this is a resolution in a second. And um, then I, I see another one here again and I see another one here. And I see another one here. And lastly, I see one here. Now, something to note here when we're trying to discover what the uh, key of a tune is, is where does it start and where does it end? Because just because it starts with a chord or a resolution doesn't mean that's the key center. Key center. Um, but you can use little subtle hints, like at different sections of the tune, where do we start and then where do we resolve to? So in this case, I'm seeing a lot of D major. So not really so much C major, or at least no real hints here. I see a bunch of different key, sig uh, key centers that we're dealing with. So kind of what I'm going to go for the theory for now is that the reason there is no sharps or flats here is the third reason, and that would be that there are a lot of different key centers in this tune and therefore it is not really helpful to add a key signature. So that's my theory so far that uh, we are not in the key of C major or A minor. It's just we're in a bunch of different keys. So it's easier just to look at things uh, without any sharps or flats. Okay, so um, what we have here is our first resolution here, which is D major seven. So the important thing whenever you're analyzing a jazz standard is always to think what chord comes before it and what chord comes after it. So in this case, we have two chords that become come before. We have A minor seven, A seven, resolving to a D major seven. Now, this is where you really have to start understanding patterns in jazz and the important ones to look out for. Now, the first clue is I see a minor seventh chord. Okay, then it's followed by a dominant seventh chord that is resolving to a C major seven chord. And when we listen to it, right? We hear a resolution. So this is important right here. This is a five chord. 
Okay, five, one. You need to be aware of this. Now, when we look at the key of D major, and this is what I'm saying, I'm saying that D major is our first key center here. It's our first resolution. So when we look at D major, we have to think about what the five chord is of D major, and that is A7. So whenever I see a major seventh chord that's being preceded by a dominant seventh chord, I'm already thinking, is this a five, one chord progression? So right now, I'm gonna label this five. Now, the thing that really makes me feel like this is a five is we have this minor seventh in front of it, and it's an E minor seven to an A seven to a D major seven. So this E minor seven, if I'm thinking about D, if I'm relating this E minor seven to D major seven, my hypothesis, this being a key center, then I'm understanding that in the key of D major, D major, that's the one chord, the two chord is E minor. So I'm already thinking to myself, this is a two chord. All right, whoops, that's three, two. So we have a two and a five, and then like I said, a one. So the one chord is D major seven. So the first key center we're dealing with here is D major, and we have a two, five, one. E minor seven, A seven, uh, D major seven. Now, um, the two, five, one is, if you learn anything from this video, it's look for a two, five, one in jazz all the time. Even if you can't fill in the rest of the blanks, if you see minor seventh chord, dominant seventh chord, major seventh chord, start thinking to yourself, is this a two, five, one? And then what is the key center? So we're talking about D major right here. And what are the chords coming uh, before it? And does that make sense? Is it a two, five, one? So automatically, um, I started here with this chord because I saw it as a resolution and I looked at the chords that came before it. Now, now that we know that this is a two, five, one, we can also start thinking about things for improvisation. Like how many ideas, right? How many different two, five, one ideas can we come up with for a D major seven, a two, five, one and D major seven? All right, cool. So let's keep moving on. Um, again, like I said, whenever we're analyzing, look at the chords that came before and the chords that came afterwards. So I'm looking ahead now to this D minor seven right here. Now, it shares the exact same root as this D major seven. So we're essentially turning a D major seven into a D minor seven. So what's going on right there? Again, this is where context is important. Are we going to a minor one chord? Are we doing what we call um, parallel minor? I don't think so. Because we look at the chord after this and we have a dominant seventh chord following it. And again, we have this resolution here to a C major. So again, what I'm gonna start going for is, okay, is this a two, five, one? Well, G7 is definitely the five chord of C major seven. Okay, great. So let's put the five there. And let's say this is a one, whoops, don't know why that's happening. And then, okay, now let's look at the D minor seven. Is that indeed the two chord, right? C major seven, D minor seven. It is, yes, it is the two chord of C major. Okay, that's why it's important to understand diatonic harmony and just the basics, right? Because if you understand that, you can just start filling in the blanks mathematically. All right, so so far what I'm seeing here is we have a two, five, one and D major seven, and then we turn that D major seven into a minor seven, which becomes a two, five, one to C major seven. Okay, so now I'm starting to get it here. We're cycling through some different chord progressions here. All right, let's look ahead now. So again, once again, we have the same kind of relationship happening over here in bar nine. We have a C minor seven shares the same root as the C major seven that came before it. Again, what chord's coming after the C minor seven? I'm seeing a dominant seventh chord. I'm seeing a, a B flat major seventh chord here. So uh, we're gonna talk about this G minor seven in one second, but I'm gonna start assuming that I'm seeing a similar pattern here, right? Minor seven, dominant seven, and then a major seventh chord. So I'm gonna start automatically assuming this is a two, five, one. And honestly, a lot of this has to do with your ears too. Like I can hear, I can hear that that's a two, five, one in B flat major seven, uh, in B flat major, right? So I, I kind of just see the pattern and I hear the pattern. And the more you do this sort of thing and you learn standards by ear and all that stuff, it becomes more obvious to you. So. Now, just to kind of see what's going on here, we have 
a 251 in D major, a 251 in C major, and a 251 in B flat major. Now another thing whenever you're analyzing standards is the whole point of doing it is to make it easier for you to learn the tune and improvise over the tune. So in other words, the easiest way for you to think about it. So again, I'm not relating all these chords back to D major right here. I'm not relating them all to C major. I'm relating them to different key centers because that's what makes sense for this tune. The other thing that's going to help me memorize this tune is what are the relationships of the key centers, right? We have D major to C major to B flat major, okay? So if we take a look, D down a whole step to C, down a whole step to B flat. So if I think about tune up, I'm thinking, okay, two, five, one, starting on D major. Then we go down a whole step to a new key center, that's C. Then we go down a whole step to a new key center, that's B flat. And they're all approached with a two, five, one chord progression, at least so far. Okay. Makes sense. So we're trying to make this easier for us. That's what makes analysis valuable. So what is this G minor seven doing right here? So again, let's look at the chord that came before it, B flat major and the chord that's coming after it, E minor. Okay, so first, the most obvious thing to look at is how does this G minor seven relate to a B flat major? So if we take a look at the diatonic series, we realize that G minor seven is the six chord, okay? It is a diatonic six chord. So I'm gonna assume right away that this is a six chord. And the reason I'm just gonna assume that is because I kind of look over here to the E minor seven, and I ask myself, well, how does G minor relate to an E minor? And the immediate thoughts that come into my head aren't so obvious. And again, we'll come back to this G minor if maybe my hypothesis changes because of some of the chords I'm analyzing next here. But right now it makes a lot of sense to me that we have a two, five, one, six chord progression because that's a really popular chord progression in jazz. So I'm feeling pretty confident that that's what's happening with that G minor seven. Um, let's move on though. So this is kind of the most confusing part of tune up. So let's pay attention here. We have an E minor seven chord right here. Whoops. And we have an F seven, B flat major seven and A seven. Now the first thing, the first thing that's coming to my mind is like, what are the root note relationships of these? So we have E, a half step up to B uh, to F, and then we have a fourth relationship away to B flat major, and then down a half step to A7. So something funky is happening here. So kind of what I want to start doing is look at the rest of this form and see if I've seen any of these chords before. So we've seen E minor right up here as it relates to D major. We've seen the F7 just a second ago as it relates to this B flat major. And we, we see the same 5-1 relationship with the F7 to the B flat major 7. So it makes a lot of sense to me to automatically think to myself, okay, what we have here is a 5 to one relationship with B flat major, but that doesn't necessarily make the rest of the E minor seven, the A seven make any sense to me, right? Because like, how do those relate to B flat major? I mean, if you really think about it, they don't really have anything to do with B flat major. So how do we make sense of this? So again, when I look at the E up here at the D major, E minor and A7 relate to D major 7 as they do with a 2-5. And I'm seeing those down here. I'm seeing an A7 here and an E minor 7 over here. So um, I'm going to kind of go take a leap of faith with an idea here that these two are related together, right? It's kind of like you have a puzzle and you're trying to find the pieces that relate together in this particular case. So I'm going to say that, you know, this is actually a 2 five relationship now a two five relationship to what to d major right to d major um that that would make a lot of sense right so this wouldn't be a two five relationship to b flat or any of the other keys it'd be to d major so the big question though is you know what what is really going on here right because it's like it's almost like we have this little cadence here that is interrupting the flow of a two five re relationship that's trying to get back to the one and if you listen to the melody, by the way, it sounds like this. A7. And so you feel like it's going to go back to the D major 7. Now it doesn't. If you look at bar 17 here, it goes E minor 7, A7, D major 7. 
And then if we look ahead too, it goes D minor 7, G7, C major 7. And then C minor 7, F7, B flat major 7 with that 6 chord that we just discovered down here. So when I look at this, I go, oh, we're just repeating this first little A section here. So in other words, we're basically doing an, a, a second A section to finish off the, off the tune. So it's really the same thing. So I am thinking that this is a 2-5-1 here, but this is an interrupting pattern. Now, there's a lot of different things that you can call this. I'm going to call this what I, I call a detour cadence, okay, a detour cadence. In other words, it is a cadence that is unrelated to uh, the chord progressions that we're trying to relate to, the chords we're trying to relate back to, but they're interrupting the pattern. And it sounds great because you have an E minor 7, uh, whoops, up a half step to a dominant 7th chord, resolving to a B flat major 7 chord, so a 5, 1, and then a half step down. So you're approaching this detour cadence by half steps. Just, so it just sounds really good. Like they connect together almost in an organic way, even though they are not at all related to each other. So it's kind of an interesting cadence. But this is really the only way you can really analyze this, I think. So you have this detour cadence that's interrupting the two patterns. But the key here is we're really trying to get back to the top of the form, which is D major, right? Okay, so this cool detour cadence just makes things really musical and creative, I think, and it fits beautifully with the melody, which melody is king, right? Okay, like I said, we repeat ourselves here throughout the rest of the tune, except for instead of going to this little detour cadence at the end, we end on an E minor 7, A7, D major 7, which we've already identified is what? It's a 2, 5, 1. So... Kind of what I think here is that the, the, this key has a parent key center and it's D major as in that's the one we keep going back home to, right? That's where we keep trying to go back home to, but we're interrupted by a bunch of other key centers. So when we see no key signature here, it's not that we're in the key of C or that we're in the key of, um, or that we're in the key of A minor. It's just that we have a lot of different key centers going through. So it's detrimental to really identify a key center. So again, if I'm looking at this tune and I'm thinking, okay, now that I've analyzed it, how do I improvise over this better? I'm thinking to myself, I need to learn a lot of 251 um, language because that's really all this tune is. And I want to really focus in on this section and how do I connect these chords together? And that's where I would do a lot of chord tone mapping just to see how those work and resolve to each other. I would focus on resolving to the guide tones, the thirds and sevenths. And then I would just compose as many different ideas as possible over top of that section. Because to me personally, that's the hardest section that we uh, are going to encounter in tune up as far as improvising goes. So I hope this was helpful and that this helped you see how I analyze jazz standards and why I do it. What I'd love to hear from you in the comments below is how do you analyze jazz standards and what are some tips that you have for doing it better? And hey, if you're interested in learning more jazz standards, understanding them better, and just becoming a better jazz improviser in general, I'd highly recommend you check out my LJS Inner Circle membership. It is a membership that includes monthly jazz standard studies with resources like etudes and chords analysis, all sorts of stuff, as well as access to a bunch of uh, jazz practice programs and courses, live Q&A calls, and a really vibrant of community of other like-minded musicians. Um, so if you want to check that out, I'll leave that right here for you to explore it a little bit, see if it's right for you, or you can go to ljsinnercircle.com. And uh, hey, I appreciate you. Thanks for watching the video. Make sure you subscribe. Uh, hope to see you in my Inner Circle program or just on another YouTube video. And I'll look forward to seeing you in the next one.